Thank you for everybody coming. Uh, today we have uh, a special guest calling in from Switzerland, so I appreciate you staying up late. Uh, Manuel is a postdoc at uh, ETH. Um, prior to that, he was a PhD student at the uh, Johannes Kepler University uh, in Austria. His background is not databases. His background is compilers and PL, um, but he sort of, I mean, are you going to tell the story in your talk or no? Oh, you About. mentioned it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so the reason why he got involved in testing databases is because uh, for his own research, he was putting some data in a database, and then it hit a bug, and he lost all his data. And so he's like, well, this is bad. Let me go run some tests on databases and see if I can find bugs. So that's that's what he's done. So SQL Lancer is a, is a new project that he's been working on uh, for, for a while. And this is sort of the hottest thing now in like in database testing in the open source world. Um, and I, I, I mean, you'll talk about this, like a lot of people are already adopting it. So it's for the project only being around in a short amount of time, you've had amazing, uh, you know, an amazing response and reception about, about it. So that's, that's amazing. That's the power of databases, right? Okay. Before we turn it over and go to Emmanuel, uh, again, the way we want to do this is that if you want to ask a question, by all means, just interrupt him, but be sure to say who you are and where you're coming from so that everyone knows who everyone is. Okay. All right, Manuel, go for it. Thank you, thank you for being here. Okay, uh, thank you, Andy. Also, very uh, thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. I'm, I'm really glad um, that you uh, gave the opportunity to that I can present the work today. So, as Andy said, I've been working on finding logic bugs in database management systems together with my advisor, Jono Su, here uh, from ETH Zurich. So, in our work, we have been focusing on finding logic bugs which immediately poses the first questions. First question, what are logic bugs? So let's assume that we have some query that we send to the database management system. Here you can see um, that in this example and also in future examples, I will use this phi a symbol to denote a Boolean predicate. And let's assume that we have a database here with two records for two, um, the predicate evaluates to true. But then we would expect that both these rows are fetched, but um, in the case of a logic bug, only one of them might be fetched. Another example for a logic bug might be that the row is mistakenly fetched or that the contents of the result set is incorrect. We argue that uh, finding logic, bug, uh, logic bugs is a difficult challenge because they might go unnoticed by users and also by developers of database management systems. This is unlike crash bugs, for example, where a user gets immediate feedback because the process um, ends, for example, with a non-zero exit code. Isn't the problem already solved? So if we look at uh, what testing processes, um, database management systems, or at least uh, mature database management systems like SQLite, for example, use, it might seem so. So specifically, SQLite has about 700 times as much test code as source code, which is already quite an impressive number. SQLite's test cases achieve even 100% branch test coverage. Uh, even better, they achieve 100% MCDC coverage, which is a coverage metric that is typically used for software development in the aviation industry. So this is also very impressive. SQLite is also extensively fast, for example, by Google's open source fast project, and also by individual researchers. And just as another example, SQLite, I mean, does uh, several kinds of testing, like unit testing, but they even do anomaly testing where they verify that SQLite works even correctly in the presence of out of memory error situations, input output error situations, or power failures. Nevertheless, in our work, we found over 400 bugs in popular and widely used database management systems, so quite a number in SQLite but also in other database management systems like MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, CockroachDB, TiDB, and DuckDB. So what are the ingredients for testing database management systems or for testing software in general? First of all, we need an effective test case. In our context, this means that we want to generate a database that can um, stress the database management system in order to expose a bug and similarly, also a meaningful query. Also, we need a test oracle. A test oracle validates the query's result and basically says if it's correct 
or not. Now for the purposes of this talk, we assume that an automatically generated database and query are already given. We assume this because this is actually the easier part of the problem. And this has also already been well researched and there are, for example, many random database or query generators. We focus on the second part of the talk, namely, we propose test oracles for finding logic bugs. So what is a test oracle? As I said, basically, given some input, it determines whether the system works as expected. And one test oracle would be to have a programmer who basically writes the specification um, like writing down what, what the expected result of the unit test is. But here we are interested in automatic test oracles that can automatically do this. So what, what could we consider to achieve this? I mean, the first uh, thing that you're probably all familiar with is fussing. So we could take a random query generator like SQL Smith, which is perhaps the most widely used one. And um, this query generator would send random queries to the database management system and hopefully expose a bug, like a segmentation fault, where basically the test oracle is that the process exits with this error. Now, while SQL Smith and other random query generators have been very effective in finding crash bugs, unfortunately, we cannot use them to detect logic bugs because they simply cannot um, detect these cases. Now, um, one approach uh, to detect logic bugs, which works at first sight, is to use differential testing, where basically we have a query generator that generates a SQL query that is then sent to multiple database management systems, for example, here, Postgres, MySQL, and SQL, and then we would get back three different result sets, and we could compare this in order to determine um, whether they are same or not. If they are same, then we didn't detect a bug, but if they differ, then at least one of the systems is affected by a bug. Um, so this approach has first been proposed by Microsoft Research in about uh, in around 2000. And the authors mentioned that um, differential testing has been very helpful for them. They could detect many bugs, but only for the small set of common SQL. This is also what we and uh, actually also other people realized. So for example, uh, Cockroach Labs, they published a blog post where they stated specifically that they cannot use Postgres as an oracle. So Postgres is the database management system whose SQL dialect is uh, the closest to CockroachDB. Namely, the reason being that it has slightly different semantics and it would be tricky to generate queries that execute identically on both the systems. Besides fussing and differential testing, also other approaches have been proposed so in terms of logic uh, testing, perhaps the uh, most impactful one is the one by Kalek and others. So they had the idea that they can use solvers to tackle this problem, like SMT solvers. And um, they could find a number of um, injected bugs. They could also reproduce already known bugs, but they found only one new bug. And here we believe that SMT solvers uh, might not have a high enough throughput to detect uh, many bugs. Um, as another example, there have been approaches proposed for performance testing. Um, I guess a number of you heard the presentation uh, last or two weeks ago on Apollo. And this approach is effective for, to testing, or for testing for performance bug, but it's unclear how um, logic bugs could be detected. And for example, another approach was also to um, test for the cost accuracy of the query planner. But overall, we have to conclude that the problem of testing database management systems to find logic bugs has not yet been well addressed. And this is where our work comes in. So we have been working on three uh, new practical approaches for finding logic bugs, namely pivoted query synthesis, PQS, non-optimizing reference engine construction, NoRec, and ternary logic partitioning, TLB. So pivoted query synthesis was our first approach. We found about 100 bugs uh, using it. And the core idea of this approach is that we want to generate a query for which it is ensured that it fetches a randomly selected row that uh, to which we refer as the pivot row. If the pivot row is then not contained in the result set, we have detected a bug. 
The second approach that we proposed was non-optimizing reference engine construction. The idea of this approach was to generate a query that is likely optimized by the database management system and then transforming it in a way that the database management system cannot effectively optimize it, thus allowing to detect um, bugs specifically in the query optimizer of a database management system. Is that, is that throwing SQL or is that something lower? Um, uh, uh, that's actually in SQL. Okay. So it's a completely a black box approach and actually the advantage is that um, while it's, it's unobvious how to come up with it, it's actually quite uh, straightforward to implement. Okay. And the last approach um, is, a or the latest approach is ternary logic partitioning. This has allowed us to find over 50 bugs in widely used database management systems. And the idea of this approach is that we want to partition the query into several so-called um, partitioning queries, each of which computes a partition, and then um, to combine these partitions so that the same result set as the original query can be uh, generated. And this approach is actually applicable to quite, test quite a number of different SQL queries. And since you just ask Andy, so all three approaches, they work as black box approaches, they only work on the SQL level, which makes them general and uh, widely applicable to test uh, any kind of, of system that uh, supports SQL. So maybe, maybe this is what SQL answer is. SQL answer is a combination of all three? Exactly, yes. Beautiful, okay, keep going, sorry. Uh, no, thanks. Please go ahead when, whenever you have any questions. Yeah, so uh, as, as just mentioned, uh, SQL Answer implements all three approaches. Maybe not all of them are as maintained, but we're actually currently working on, on improving the code quality and also the testing infrastructure of, of SQL Answer. And um, since last uh, Tuesday or so, it's actually available as open source software. So feel free to check it out and report any issues that you might find. Also, if any questions we have, we also have a Slack channel and so on, a Slack workspace. And uh, with that, I want to continue by introducing one of the techniques um, that we have been working on, namely ternary logic partitioning. So the idea of ternary logic partitioning is first of all based on a more general idea that we came up with um, and to which we refer as query partitioning. The idea looks as follows. So first of all, we have a query generator that generates a random query uh, Q. And to this query, we refer as the original query. You can also say here that in general, we use this circle to denote a result set of the respective query. And then we want to partition uh, the result set of this original query by um, deriving uh, multiple queries from it. So each of these um, derived queries then computes a part of the result that can then be composed to yield a new result set. And basically, um, this result set should yield the uh, same result. If they do, then everything seems to work correctly. And if not, then we have detected a logic bug in the system. So um, this queries that you derive from the original query, we will refer to them in the further as a partitioning queries. And um, these parts of the result that are computed, we refer to them as the partitions. And this uh, diamond symbol here, um, basically we, we call it the composition operator. So I guess the general um, approach probably sounds plausible to you, but of course it's not obvious how to realize it. Specifically, the key challenge is that we want to find a valid partitioning strategy that, first of all, works, for which we can define a composition operator and so on, but also that stresses the database management system in different ways so that we can find bugs in it. And the main insight of this approach is the following. So let's consider that we have some given predicate, which is probably randomly generated, and any given row. And exactly one of the following must hold. Either this predicate evaluates to true, either not, um, and this predicate evaluates to true, or this predicate is null evaluates to true. Basically meaning, since uh, SQL is a ternary logic, either phi evaluates to true, to false, or to null. 
and we refer to these um, predicates, like based on this given phi here, um, as the ternary predicate variance. And the idea is the following. Now, let's assume that we have uh, some, some given result set. Then we can use this idea by filtering out um, rows where the predicate holds, where it doesn't hold, and where it averages to null to partition it into three uh, parts. And that is the core insight of, of our approach. Now, this was perhaps maybe a, a little bit abstract, so I want to continue by um, demonstrating a bug that we found in MySQL. So you can see here that uh, first we generated two tables. Um, both uh, of them contain one row. So here we have a, a zero value contained and here a minus zero. And um, you can see here that in this query we want to fetch all records where these two um, values evaluate to the same uh, value. And while this um, predicate was expected to evaluate to true, unexpectedly it didn't, and MySQL failed to fetch this row. What was the data type for those columns? Um, so that's a good question. I think for T1 it was float because we have uh, minus yeah. zero. Yeah, okay, yeah. And I think for, for T0 it, it was uh, int, but I'm, I'm not sure it might also have been a float. Okay. But um, actually, so, um, yeah, the, the underlying bug here was, I think, uh, a bug in the hash join of, the, of MySQL. Interesting, okay, cool. So now the question is, how, how did we derive this, um, that this is a bug based on TLB? So we did it in the following way. First, we generated a random query, which uh, looks like this. So basically just fetching the cross product of all values um, in T0 and T1. And this query is quite simple, right? So we wouldn't expect any, uh, that MySQL processed this incorrectly and indeed MySQL fetched the correct result for it. And based on this query, we derived now the partitioning queries. So you can see here that we have the uh, three ternary predicate variants here, namely ones where this um, evaluates to true, ones where it evaluates to false, and ones where it evaluates to uh, null. And for this query, MySQL unexpectedly didn't fetch any rows, which is unexpected because uh, we assumed that these two result set uh, would be the same. And this allowed us to detect this bug and basically reduce it to the version that I showed on the previous slide to conveniently report it then. So you automatically do that co coalescing. Right? Exactly, like, yes. Oh, interesting, exactly. cool. So basically we just um, randomly generate this query and then there is a mechanic um, process that can derive this query from, from the original query. If you have time, I actually um, can show you at the end in the demo how this is implemented because um, it only is implemented a couple of lines of code. So um, TLB and also some of the other approaches like NoRec that we proposed, they're quite easy to implement, especially since they only operate on, on the SQL level. Demo would be awesome. Go ahead. So, so I, have, I have a question. Sorry for interruption. Huh? So I wonder what kind of... Lin, say who you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, I'm Lin. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, mm -hmm. working with Andy on databases, right? So um, I'm wondering what kind of bugs would this cover? So clearly this would cover uh, the bugs when you evaluate predicates. But for example, if, if the query is a uh, uh, aggregation query, right? you may have a bug in computing the average value or some mathematical like, operation on a set of rows. Would this kind of bug also solve those? Would, also, would this approach also be able to discover those kind of bugs? Yeah, that's a very good question, and um, um, I will actually present still some examples for testing aggregate functions. So I would say we, um, maybe like um, I will come back to this uh, okay. later if cool. if it's fine. Okay. Cool, thank okay. you. Yeah. But a very good question, thanks. Um, yeah. So how does this approach? Uh, sorry, can I can I ask a quick question here? Mm -hmm. uh, so my name is Chi. I'm a PhD uh, student in Georgia Tech. So okay. my so, so so my question is it, it sounds sounds like this technique was basically trying to generating because the left query and the right query are semantically equivalent right so they're expected to get the same result exactly. but uh, 
Yeah, but uh, but but the pro. Uh, so I so I so I have ha so I have been working on these like a uh, testing database uh, for a while, like a couple months. So 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 my wondering was like, there are already many systems uh, serve as a database optimizer, right? So basically, a database optimizer is trying to trying to like uh, uh, transform a Q -Q a query that can execute in fast fast faster, but it's a different query. So basically, mm -hmm. have you ever tried like use a data uh, like a, a database optimizer trying to rewrite a query? So basically, you get like two different query and see if they can get like the different result to expose the bug. Yes, yeah, so I think that's also a very good idea. It would be possible to do um, similar like uh, optimizations like database management systems do, but we believe here that, or I believe here that this um, would involve uh, more work because uh, we would need to define these individual rules for all the operators um, to define basically the metamorphic relations. Yeah, but, uh, but the, the thing here I was thinking about was because all these transformation rules actually have been implemented by the other systems, right? So the, mm -hmm. from the testing perspective, we kind of get all these transformation rules for free. But these, I mean, these, these transformation rules are serving the purpose trying to optimize the execution for the, uh, uh, for, for, for the SQL. So it might not be suitable for the testing purposes, but I'm just wondering, have you tried or like uh, some, some, something like that? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I think that might be a good idea, but like one, um, one goal that we wanted to achieve is also that we wanted to have a system um, or an approach that works in general for all database management systems and we, which we wouldn't need like to basically implement on a, a for each query optimizer specifically to basically hook into the database management system. So this works only on a SQL level and I think that's, that's a, a core advantage of this approach because you do not need any knowledge about the underlying query optimizer. You can just randomly generate queries, derive uh, the partitioning queries and then check for the result. But it would be an interesting idea to, to explore this further, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for it. Yeah. Not to toot my own horn, but we, we actually generate the correct result for this query. So I'm happy. Oh, sorry? Uh, okay. <laughs> Keep going. Our, our database doesn't have this bug. We crash on something else, ah, though. OK. <laughs> so you can see here um, in the illustration um, how um, the previous example relates to this approach. So first of all, you can see here that for this um, query queue, we had this, this simple query, which uh, simply fetches the cross product of uh, all values. Then we have this um, partitioning queries here, namely one with the non-negated version of the predicate, one with the negated version of the predicate, and finally the is null version of it. Well, and for the composition operator, I didn't mention it just now in the example, but um, here we use the union all operator which basically combines the records without filtering out uh, duplicate values, uh, duplicate records. Now, um, I've demonstrated that the technique is applicable to test work clauses, but I received also the question before if we can test aggregate functions, and the answer is yes. So the approach is general in the sense that it can be applied to quite a number of different features. And now I want to um, demonstrate how we can find bugs in group by clauses, in having clauses, in distinct queries, and also in aggregate functions. So, so are the other types of queries, like say common table expressions, uh, nested queries, is that just, be, just because you haven't gotten that far to actually test those queries, or is there something more fundamental about your approach that it wouldn't work? Um, so I guess it's just that we haven't really thought about testing them yet. So. We okay. concentrated on the on the core patterns, but I think um, the idea of query partitioning and also of, of ternary query partitioning, it might be like there are several combinations also possible, and also um, I think we could test more different features. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I already explained how we test um, work clauses or the correct implementation of them. And for this and for the subsequent um, test oracles, I want to use this kind of table format here, which is sufficient to fully describe uh, the test oracles. So you can see here that we have this original query for the work loss oracle. Then we have here the partitioning queries in the second column. 
where we have the ternary predicate variants uh, in the work loss. And finally, here we have the third column, which describes the implementation of the composition operator. Now, here you might uh, maybe not all be familiar. Um, this symbol here basically denotes the multi-set addition, which um, combines the records, but without filtering out duplicates. And in SQL, we can implement this using this union all clause. Now, how can we test having clauses? Um, that's, uh, I would say, quite a straightforward extension. So this time we have the ternary predicate variants in the having clause. And besides that, we can also randomly generate work clauses and group by clauses, which are simply copied, copied over uh, to the um, partitioning queries. And the composition operator is implemented in the same way as for testing work clauses as well. For testing distinct clauses, the original query here contains a distinct clause. Uh, and for the partitioning queries, we can either decide to also include it or to omit it, because here the insight is that the composition operator is implemented differently. You can see here that we are using the set union to implement um, the union. For group by clauses, um, it also looks similar. So here it's important to note that um, we need to fetch all columns that uh, are denoted here in the group by clause, because also here, we use the set union, which filters out uh, duplic uh, duplicate values. Now we uh, come to the more difficult uh, part, or also more interesting one. How do we test aggregate functions? There, our test oracles are specific to the respective aggregate function that we want to test. So probably one of the simplest aggregate functions to test is uh, are the max and the min functions for these uh, first of all, the original and partitioning queries look perhaps as, as you would expect. But here for the composition operator, I want to point out that before, like in, in the, for the previous test oracles, the um, partition corresponds to a subset of the result. And here it is an intermediate result. So for the maximum value, it's basically here the maximum value that we computed for the rows. And in order to derive the overall maximum value, we need to apply another, um, uh, another max um, function. Now, since uh, it gets a little bit more complex, I also want to show you a concrete example, the bug that we found in CockroachDB. You can see here that this required actually an experimental vectorizer flag and also interleaved tables. And here, we sent the original query to CockroachDB and it returned a single row with the value null. And then we derived these partition queries from it. So you can see the ternary predicate variance again here. Each of them computes the maximum value. And then we need this another outer application of the max function to derive the overall maximum value. And this allowed us to detect this bug here in CockroachDB. So, like, in the, for that particular example, out of curiosity, like, I mean, you, you're using, can you go back to the last slide? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Like, you're using their vectorized engine, but then you're also using, uh, like, physical denormalization because you're interleaving into the parent table. Like, that, so, like, who, like, who told you to turn those things on, right? Is that something your thing automatically generates, or is that, like, but that's, the, that's like the, the, the custom code you have to write for a cockroach to say, when you're gonna create a table, here's different variations you can do. Oh yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So um, in general, the database generator and also the query generator, they are specific to each database management system that you want to test. Typically, this okay, are, okay. yeah. So basically we have um, at the beginning, before we apply our test oracles, we randomly generate a database. So basically some random, uh, first create table statements and then some inserts and also all the other potential options that, that are applicable in this context. And only then we basically apply this, this test oracle. And all of these are specific to the database management system that we want to test. And so in all the examples you've shown, you've shown so far, there's been one column in each table. Like, does this also work for multiple columns? Does it, does it actually matter for what you're trying to do? Yeah, that's also a good question. So. Um, it supports, like we support the uh, arbitrary number of columns, 
but for to reproduce most test cases, we we only need one. It's yeah. also for actually for for the majority of test cases, we also only need one table that we found. So I think in in our first work, we actually analyzed this closer, but but I don't remember the the exact numbers from from then. Okay, All right, and cool. um. And basically, also before we report a bug, uh, we try to minimize them or reduce them as far as possible. So there are some automatic tools to do this. Uh, for example, C reduce, which uh, which has C C plus plus specific um, um, passes, but it also works uh, quite reasonably well for for SQL. Uh, hi, uh, can I ask a quick question here? So, how many queries you need to generating for te testing, say, croc range DB to find these bugs? Have you like count like how many te test cases you generated? Yeah, that's that's also a good question. So. For our evaluations, we always um, develop the database management system at the same time also applied it. And we did this typically over a longer period of, of let's say three to five months, like for, for all the database management systems that we tested. So we cannot give you any like statistics on this, but from my personal experience is that actually after we implemented, let's say a new operator and we let SQL Lancer run for let's say one minute, then typically most of the bugs would already be found like within this one minute. So depending on the database management system, a SQL Lancer generates, let's say about 10,000 queries a second. And it seems that um, many of the bugs can already be detected uh, very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry, just, so just a quick follow up on the, on the question on supporting different systems. So mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, so you just said that um, uh, for different system, uh, the system developer would provide the database generator and the query generator, right? Mm -hmm. Then I'm wondering for the rules, do you have to re-implement all your rules for each system or you can, you can somehow reuse the same set of rules, but like hook those rules, those implementations uh, to different systems through like uh, some layer in between? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think that's uh, more implementation detail, but right. um, currently uh, I think SQL Answer is not um, implemented that uh, clean. But actually, since I have here the source code, I, I might as well um, just um, shortly explain this uh, or demonstrate it. Sure, sure. So That'd here's, cool. for example, so here's for example the um, implementation of the work loss oracle. You can see here that we have a common uh, partitioning base where here we generate, for example, a random select statement. So here you can see that we generate a random like joins from clauses and so on. And um, here in the class again that implements the query partitioning where Oracle, where we basically first set um, the work clause with the non-negated version, the negated version, and the is null version, and then we get the, the result set. So it's, it's actually, um, quite reasonable to, to implement. Um, it's, it doesn't require too much effort. And maybe also very quickly, um, the core component for generating random queries is random expression generation. And also there we have quite a naive approach implemented. So we just select um, some of the applicable options, for example, some unary prefix operation and so on. And there we um, just select any of the applicable options, for example, not operator plus or minus and so on. And then we, um, at the end, have a visit that it derives a string. So it's actually, I would say, reasonable from the terms of implementation effort. Right, right, right. But, but also, I, I saw this, this, this said duck DB, some prefix operator. That means that for another DB, like cockroach DB, this thing would be re-implemented, re right? Right, right, exactly. So I guess it. it would make sense to try to factor this uh, out, but, um, yeah, it's it's we we haven't done this uh, yet, and it's every database management system provides like unique operators, unique options, and so on, which is right. why they are basically mostly separate. Right, 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 definitely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But it also means it also means that like, how do I say this? Um, like the 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 this. I, mean, I guess it's true in anything. The scope. It's not like the fuzzer where the fuzzer just permute some random stuff and then and they, they, they can eventually you'll find something. In your case, like if, if I don't write the code to cover you know, a part of the system, then like your thing never, never, never explores it. I see, you, you sort of want both. So you want the fuzzer plus this thing. 
or take the schema that the fuzzer generates and somehow extract out the, you know, the, these different constructs of the operators. Or just as you, as you said, like have a common denominator, you know, lowest common denominator of the SQL standard across multiple systems and, and then build the custom stuff on top of it. Yeah, so can I have like one very, 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 very quick question here? Sorry, so like oh, yeah, how, how, how did you randomly generating the data? Like um, so uh, the, the, data, the yeah. So basically the insert statements, they're also randomly generated. So when you say like, a, so when you say like each second you're generating about like 10,000 queries, are these like queries for one in, instance of database or for each query you kind of like uh, have their own in, instance? Or like, what's the um, ra ratio here? Like, uh, like number of queries compared to number of instances you generated. Right, that's a good question. So, um, what I was referring to is when we already have a database generated. So, generating a database takes a little bit more time than generating the queries. So, typically, we provide heuristics where the user can select how many uh, queries should be generated for each database management system. So, typically, I think we would uh, generate around. Uh, 10,000 queries for each database that is generated or, or a little bit more maybe. Okay, so, so, so sorry for, 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 for this, but like, so because I saw all these examples, it seems like you only need like a one or two or three or, or zero tuples in, in your in, in instance. Have you ever find a bug that requires like a not large number of tuples to trigger that bug? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the examples that I've shown you, they have been automatically reduced. And uh, it's basically the original test case, we found them with more complicated um, like um, data and also more complicated queries. So they are basically reduced to the minimum to reproduce their respective bug. Thank you. So, so if time allows, actually, um, we will see later if I can show you a demo or so to, to show how, how typical queries and, and data looks in SQL Answer. All right, keep going, this is good. Okay, uh, thanks. So the um, first um, um, aggregate function that I showed you how to test, namely max, was a so-called self-decomposable aggregate function. So I don't want to um, explain now the formal underpinnings of this, but I want to tell you that there is also another category of decomposable aggregate functions, and this is best explained on an example. So you can, basically the intuition here is that if you want to test, for example, the average aggregate function, then it's insufficient that we, in the partition, compute a single value. Rather, we need here to keep track of the sum and the count to then um, derive the overall um, average. And that's uh, basically also allows uh, testing decomposable aggregate functions, like by including tuples um, um, when computing the partitions. There's also another category of uh, aggregate functions, namely non-decomposable ones. Group concat is one example which concatenates strings, and there actually the order is important. We didn't consider testing them because it would be more complicated, but also because um, we would expect that few optimizations are applicable to them due to the same reasons as uh, we have difficulties testing them. I think that's only in my SQL too. That's on the SQL standard. Ah, that, that's possible, yeah, right. Yeah. right. Yeah, so overall we evaluated this um, approach in, I think, um, in three months of uh, implementing and running our tool and reporting and reducing bugs. In this time, we have found uh, close to 200 bugs, 123 of which have been fixed. Um, we evaluated the approach on, on six database management systems. Actually, only five here are shown because um, for this latest approach, we actually didn't find any bug in, in Postgres. Um, and you can also see here in SQLite, which we comprehensively tested before, we only found four new bugs. What I also want to stress here is that the total number of bugs that we found reflect our testing efforts and not how, like, how um, well the database management system is tested or what, what the quality of the database management system is. So at this point, I also want to give a shout out to the BugDB and the SQLite developers who have, which have been especially responsive and typically fixed our bugs even with on one day of reporting them. So what test oracles did we use to find these bugs? Well, first of all, um, there were oracle found most of them. It's not only the simplest, but it seems also the most effective test oracle. 
And what I also shortly want to mention here is that um, in our evaluation, we found that this oracle has some overlap with um, one of the oracles that we had previously proposed. For the other functions, or for the other oracles, we found fewer bugs, but still a number of interesting ones. Um, and here I also want to note that we implemented these oracles only for database management systems for which our bug finding efforts saturated using this word test oracle. Um, and these are the ones highlighted in red. Because we found um, that we often have problems uh, filtering out duplicate bugs and also that, for example, having test oracle can find a number of bugs that also the word oracle can find simply because it also generates word clauses. Now, I slowly want to start wrapping up. Um, I want to mention that uh, TLB is a metamorphic testing approach which has some implications. Namely, a metamorphic testing approach in this context means that we have a SQL query that we execute and uh, we get this result set. And based on these two components, we derive a new SQL query that functions as a test case and also a test oracle that decides whether the um, test case executes as expected. Now, the fundamental limitation of metamorphic testing approaches is that they cannot establish a ground truth. So it might be that we cannot detect a number of bugs simply because the database management system um, is consistent, but, uh, but still um, like buggy. Um, also to shortly compare it with the other approaches that we proposed. So all three approaches that we have proposed so far can test work clauses but only TLB is applicable to uh, comprehensively test other features such as aggregate functions. On the other hand, um, PQS, the first approach that we proposed is the only one that can establish a ground truth, but this is also re reflected in the implementation effort. So for PQS, the implementation effort is moderate, but here for TLB, as I also have uh, demonstrated in the code, it's actually quite low and no rec, it's even lower. So for PQS and NoRec, it's the same thing like TLP, where I would have to write some custom Java code that generate the queries. Exactly, yes. So they're basically okay. all based on the same table generator and also on the same query generator. It's basically then just ah. um, configured to, um, to provide the test oracle that we define. Okay, so, so if, I, if I did what you did for DuckDB, mm -hmm. or take the cockroach one, like, just those two class files would be enough to run all three tests. Um, so actually, it looks a little bit different for each um, oracle that we want to support. So um, okay, I mean you have to show me now. But okay, oh, that's good. Yeah, sorry. I understand. Okay, cool. Keep going. Okay, sounds good. So um, I also want to shortly talk about the reception we have received so far. So. I, I would say the majority of database management systems that we tested received quite positive feedback from the developers, especially the cockroach DB folks have been very supportive and appreciative of our work. So for example, here, a Jordan from Cockroach Labs even said that we are doing the database industry a great service, or here, Peter, which, um, which said that he is a fan of our uh, metamorphic testing approaches. As another example, the DuckDB developers, they appreciate our testing efforts because DuckDB is quite a, a recent uh, database management systems. And Mark, who also presented, I think, a couple of weeks ago, told us that he appreciates the work because otherwise users would uh, basically have a not as good as experience. And also, since we can provide more compact test cases to re reduce the issues. And as a last example for developer reception, so PinkCap, the database management system developing TidyB, we actually participated in their bug finding challenge. And in this bug finding challenge, 22 of the bugs that we reported were classified as P1 bugs, so the second highest severity level, and six as P2, which demonstrates uh, that um, our bug finding approach can find many severe bugs. And actually, uh, when we redeem the points that we uh, obtained, uh, we can redeem them for, I think, 117 uh, t-shirts. So Did you get those t-shirts? Um, not yet, but uh, let, let's see. <laughs> I can also redeem them to, for, for hoodies, so uh, maybe it won't be 117 t-shirts. Then 
as Andy um, mentioned during the introduction, industry has uh, started to adopt our approaches. So we have been contacted uh, by quite a number of, of companies, organizations and developers that I uh, already started implementing the approaches or which uh, were interested in implementing them. And of those, BigCap uh, already open sourced their tool, which is called Go SQL Answer, and they support all free approaches in their system. Um, now, last, I also want to talk about bug importance. So, of course, we found bugs of different severity levels, so also many um, not so severe bugs, but also many severe bugs. But I want to argue that even the less severe bugs matter. And for this, I have a concrete uh, anecdote that I want to tell, namely a uh, user of SQLite reported this following test case on the SQLite mailing list, stating that this query here um, computed the incorrect result. And another user confronted um, the original uh, bug reporter saying that you cannot do this work clause in production code. I mean, you can see it's, it's quite convoluted. And the user defended themselves stating that uh, the query was generated by some middleware. Uh, yeah, so automatically derived, not a uh, user specified. And we actually found the same underlying bug. We reported it to the SQLite developers. They quickly fixed it. So at the time when the user reported this bug, it was actually already fixed on the latest development version. And I believe that this shows that even bugs that might be considered as obscure, they might affect some users, especially when queries are um, generated by some code generators. Um, I guess I'm already over time or? Hey, you get five minutes for a demo. Five minutes for go, a demo, okay. Go, go for it. Okay, sounds good. So basically I'm going now to the SQLite, uh, uh, sorry, to the SQL answer homepage. I'm uh, cloning the repository. It should take uh, one second. Building should be quite we, trivial. We only see the, the PowerPoint. Oh, you only see the PowerPoint. Um, I'm just uh, stopping the share and... Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Ah, great. Let me make it bigger. So we're now in the uh, directory yep. of uh, SQL answer. What we only need to do now is we use a Maven to build the project which should only take also uh, a couple of seconds here. You can see that all the test cases execute um, correctly because we don't have any at the moment, but hopefully soon. And then basically we already have this uh, char here that is generated. And then we can directly launch it using Java. And if you use SQL answer without any option, it will first print all the supported database management systems. So here, for example, DuckDB, and also um, the different options that are supported. And then basically we can select that we want to test uh, DuckDB. And now every five seconds or so, some progress information should be output, namely um, how many queries that we generate and also how many databases. What we so can that's saying, also so that, so that, That's saying that 50% of the queries are failing. Um, successful sorry? statements 50 it says successful statements 50 percent so that means oh yeah 50, yes okay so basically we have a very naive um, database and query generation process so most of the statements fail or, or half as, as shown here um, what we can now also quickly look at is um, the logs that the SQL answer produces um, yeah we'll just open it using Gini now and basically what we can see here is that first some tables are generated, then some random actions are uh, selected. So here you can see a couple of insert statements, actually quite a number of insert statements. And if we go a little bit uh, farther a bit uh, low, you can see the uh, queries that are generated. So here's the original query, actually quite similar to the MySQL example that demonstrated. And then the partition queries here where we have um, the free um, ternary predicate variants. Well, and I guess that's um, that's um, the overview wait, wait. of how. Yeah. Wait, like, how do I know which one failed? Like, you have your your log file has whatever 
Oh yeah, so now none of them failed because um, we cannot find any more bugs on the latest version of DuckDB. But um, if it detects a bug, it will still uh, fail with an error message and also explain what uh, what went wrong. But it, so in, in your in your debug output when you were running it, it was saying successful statement is fifty percent. Ah, so, that, so so that's that's basically it sends a query to the database management system, but it might be semantically incorrect. So we oh, okay, 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 yeah. correct ones, but but not semantically or not necessarily. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Awesome. All right. Um, so again, let's we're we're virtual, so we can't applause, but I'll you know I'll I'll applause for everyone else. Uh, we have just two minutes left. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Manuel? Again, just un unmute yourself and say who you are and, and would you know, ask your question. Hi, I'm I'm Stephen Frost. Uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me. I'm with yes. uh, Chris Judas. So I think you mentioned earlier. Sorry, I was in the middle of something else when uh, when you asked. But um, I would be curious if you um, uh, Manuel have looked at uh, either SQL Smith or if maybe you've looked at Jepson. Um, those are two different tools that uh, get used pretty heavily to, uh, to test out Postgres. Uh, I'm also really happy to hear that Postgres didn't have any bugs in your last round. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, SQL uh, Smith, I guess, is the most uh, widely used tool for, for um, fussing and uh, finding um, crash bugs, basically. But I, I guess our goals here are different since we want to find a logic bugs. Similar also with, with Jepson. But I agree that these are very widely used and very useful tools as well. Well, Jepson is interesting because it's actually like there are things you can do in terms of serializability of transactions and ensuring that the database performs properly. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't agree that it's necessarily just a, a fuzzer. It, it does go after some, um, some issues like that, uh, which I would be interested to hear no, if no, you thought about how to do that. SQL Smith is a fuzzer. Jepson is more targeted. But, but like. Right. right. Jepson is harder to set up. Actually, Stephen, have you guys tried the new one, Ellie? Um, don't think I've played with Ellie. Well, actually, I think, I mean, hang on. I'm trying to remember if that was one of the ones that was mentioned here, because we were, yes. So Jepson slash Ellie. Is that, I mean, it's actually something that one of my coworkers, uh, Peter Gagan, was just working through um, with a Kyle Kinsbury. Of course. Working with Jepson slash Ellie to work through a, um, a a serialization isolation serializable yeah. isolation issue yes. in Postgres. Yes. I'd, I'd love to see that run against other database platforms. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Panos, I think you or Roger, you have a question. Uh, I actually I will say this is Panos Chrysanthes, University of Pittsburgh. Great uh, presentation. Very interesting tool. Absolutely. Actually, I was triggered more by one statement that uh, you said about uh, when you, the other method, when you compare three different databases of their out, uh, output, and then you said uh, possibly this tool would not work because of uh, semantic inconsistency in the language. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about using your tool, in fact, to recognize such inconsistencies and uh, uh, compare the correctness, quote unquote, in semantics of the different languages, SQL languages, uh, flavors. I think it would be interesting, but uh, the thing is also that database management systems deliberately implement uh, uh, inconsistent semantics. So it's not that every database management system wants to closely follow the, the, um, the SQL specification. And also, not everything is specified in SQL standards. So I think even creating indexes and so on, it's, it's not um, part of the specification, if, if I'm not incorrect. So I guess no. it would be, or did Quite I misunderstand good. your question? Yeah, yeah, partially, yes. But I was curious whether actually it's a good uh, starting point to use that. So everybody says, like JDBC says that they offers you some common language so that you can collect and interoperate a lot of backend databases. How can you actually truly recognize that when you are interoperating, you get the exact correct semantics? Or what would be the least common denominator? That would be uh, interesting to see, uh, you know, using these methods. Of, uh, it's just a thought that uh, occurred to me when you are talking. It's not a, it's a suggestion rather than a... a uh, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Whatever. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. So basically, to extract the, the common core between all the SQL dialects. But that's, that's, right. that's, 
that might be ANSI 92 or so. I guess that's some some minimal one, but it would be interesting to actually check if if uh, all of the database management system at least support this SQL dialect. That's correct. Uh, where did they divert it at some point in 90? So that would be interesting to see. Okay. Right. I, Raju, you have a quick question? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know like, uh, if we see, want who, to. Who you are, where are you coming from? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Raju. I'm from uh, Couchbase. So I, like, I'm interested in uh, trying to find out how we can use this tool for uh, our NoSQL. So, and, uh, you know, that's the main thing that I am interested in. So, is there any next steps that you can suggest? Um, so, we already used it from for one time series uh, based database management system and also found bugs using it. Um, I guess it would be very interesting to also investigate whether we can find bugs in documented or document oriented database management systems like MongoDB or so. Um, I think that would be a next interesting step. But I, I guess at the moment, um, we, we will still stick to to dive a little bit deeper into relational database management systems. Okay. But thanks for the suggestion. So you, 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 when you said document databases, you said MongoDB. He, he's from Couchbase. So, you know, that's ah, uh, sorry, I didn't hear at the beginning. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Also right. CouchDB. Yeah. <laughs> Couchbase, sorry. Okay, guys, uh, this has been awesome. This is, uh, again, this is, this is a super, super exciting topic, and I'm glad to see that everyone is, is recognizing uh, you know what your tool is capable of doing. So I'm I'm excited to see how this grows and, and gets wider adoption. Um, so again, thank you for Manuel for staying up late with us. I realize it's 11:30 for you at night. Uh, we really appreciate this.